This question of the moral character of the left being contrasted to the right has been covered by other channels, other channels that I really dislike and that I really think are simply not intelligent enough to handle it. But I've heard various other channels struggle with the fact, like, well, even and one of them I know is conservative. This sense of what it is to be a conservative, it's kind of mean, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, ultimately, if conservatism is just defined in terms of a reluctance to accept progress, if that's all it is, then conservatives would be, by that definition, the perpetual losers in history. That sets up a definition of left and right, whereby left, the left are the people marching forward and the right are the people dragging their heels. Now, I think that's a very unfair way to define left and right, but I understand why they're, why they're doing it. So I'm going to play you a clip of a debate between Jordan Peterson and Slavoj Žižek. And it highlights an interesting question, both retrospectively and in the present tense, about how we distinguish left from right. Now, surprisingly few people know this. The distinction between left and right goes back to the French Revolution, and specifically to the seating arrangements in the Arasats House of Parliament they put together during the French Revolution. And in fact, there were many other political terms that related to the peculiarities of that room um, there was a group of politicians called the Mountainists, and you see this if you again if you read historical fiction or primary source documents. Some of these political terms kind of lurked around, and the mountain being referred to was literally an imperfection in the woodworking, where the seats kind of rose up. There was a lump in the floor, and so some of the seats rose up. Well, yeah, those guys who sit over the by, by the mountain. In German history too, they had one of their parliaments. And different political factions were at first um, identified by the name of the pub the politicians would meet in. Um, anyway, so some of these uh, nicknames in politics come and go. But the distinction between left and right has endured for centuries. And it's taken on different kinds of, frankly, symbolic and even psychological significance we're going to talk about. Um, the point that Slavoj Žižek makes and Slavoj Žižek is not conventionally left-wing himself, is that we can't narrowly focus on self-discipline, on one's own ethos, on one's own uh, personal purity of conduct, or, say, taking good care of one's own family. And as there is note, even that idea, even rhetoric about the family is considered right-wing. It's considered conservative. This, this is already an interesting hint at how we think about left and right today. It doesn't, doesn't really make sense, but that's the, the custom of, of our time. Um, he draws attention to the futility of focusing on one's responsibility for one's own life, one's own family, and so on, if the major problems you're encountering as an individual, as a family, what have you, are problems with the larger society around you. I have an extremely common sense naive question here. But what if in trying to set your house in order, you discover that your house in, is in disorder precisely because the way the society is messed up? This is obvious in extreme situation. Like, I hope we agree to say to somebody in, in North Korea, set your house in order. No, ha <laughs> ha. But I think in some deeper sense, it goes also for our societies. I'm just repeating what you are telling. You see some kind of a social crisis, and I don't see clearly why to insist so much on this choice. Because, uh, let's sorry, just to finish, I will give you an example that I, I think perfectly does it. How do we usually deal with ecology? By this false personalization, you know, they tell you, ah, what did you do? Did you put all the Coke cans on the side? Did you recycle all paper and so? Yes, we should do this. But you know, like, uh, I, in a way, this is also a very easy way to discharge yourself. As, like, uh, you say, okay, I do the recycling, so up. You know, yeah. I did my duty, <laughs> let's go on. So I would just say, why the choice there? Okay. So the pathway towards adopting individual responsibility happens to be a very individual one. But I do believe that 
The best bet for most people is to solve the problems that beset them in their own lives, the ethical problems that beset them, that they know are problems, and that they can set themselves together well enough so that they can then become capable of addressing larger scale problems without falling prey to some of the errors that characterize, let's say, over-optimistic and intellectually arrogant ideologues. I'll close well. Yeah, but very briefly. Let me close with one thing. One of my favorite quotes from Carl Jung, it's actually a quote that I used at the beginning of my first book, which was called Maps of Meaning, was that if you take a personal problem seriously enough, you will simultaneously solve a social problem. And, and this bears on, on your point, because it's not like your small family, even the relationship between you and your wife, is immune in some sense to the broader social problems around you. And so let's say right now there's tremendous tension between men and women in the West, and, and that's certainly the case given the divorce rate, let's say, that would be some evidence. Um, and the later and later sta ages that people are waiting to become, in, uh, to, to, to you know, enter into permanent relationships. There's a, there's a real tension there. And then if you do establish a relationship with a woman or, or a partner, but we'll say a woman in this particular case, um, you are instantly faced with all of the sociological problems in a microcosm in that relationship. And then if you work those damn problems out, if you can work them out within your relationship, then you can get some insight. It's not complete insight, but you can get some partial insight into what the problem actually is and get the diagnosis right, and you've moved some small measure forward in addressing what might constitute the broader social concern. I think this little anecdotal example of Slavoj Žižek and Peterson crossing swords gives you a more meaningful way to reflect on what the differences really are. The, the strength and the weakness of conservatism, the strength and the weakness of the right both, is precisely this narrow focus ultimately on self-preservation, one's own good, one's own obligations, one's own family. And this ultimately must seem somewhat mean-spirited and uncharitable in contrast to, in 2019, the ethos of the left, which is we want to have a society in, we not, in which everybody succeeds, everybody flourishes, in which the weakest are helped, in which you know the poorest are encouraged or given health care, given access to education, and so on and so forth. It's only from a deeply right-wing standpoint that it could make sense to cut taxes and destroy the education and health care system so that the rich can pay lower taxes and spend more money on the welfare of their own families. But that is, within my lifetime, that has been the major clarion call of conservatism. So remember, ultimately, I come from Ontario, specifically lived through the so-called common sense revolution of the Mike Harris government. And that is, that is not an unfair summary of what conservatism came to mean in Ontario during my lifetime. And it has short-term electoral success, but in the long term, it's a formula for disaster. Aside from celebrating the collapse of the Soviet Union, like the collapse of communism, there's, there's really not an inspiring vision of the future there. And there also isn't fundamentally an ethos of, uh, of being helpful and encouraging and loving towards one's fellow man. Instead, it's this, this sort of close ethos. Now, that is, I think, the kind of cultural psychology of what the distinction of left and right is today. But that's not what it should be, or that's not what it was as, as created by the circumstances of the French Revolution. Um, how far can we really go if the left defines itself as the, as the party that cares about everyone, that cares about uplifting the poor, and the right defines itself as the party for caring about oneself, for caring about a narrow sense of individualism that includes individual moral responsibility, for sure, includes charity work and those things, and includes taking care of your family. This is ultimately, I mean, you know, um, this seems to me like an aesthetic assumption that's gotten out of control. <laughs> this is kind of counterproductive to any kind of meaningful discussion of, of public policy, including, for example, um, immigration. Well, immigration policy doesn't make sense for the mainstream left or the mainstream right. 
you get people on the left who take this ethic of, of helping the poorest among us who say they want completely open borders, who say they want an unlimited number of people to be able to immigrate from Cambodia and Mexico, Syrian refugees and so on. Well, I understand how that's a consistent kind of extension of this vague, you know, aesthetic sense of what the left is supposed to be, but in every other way, it's, it's deeply incoherent. And on the other hand, I mean, the right-wing position, it's deeply incoherent with the reality of America conquering Afghanistan and Iraq. It might be more consistent with isolationism, with America minding its own business, but a country that's built on genocide and an ever-expanding empire that doesn't just include Guam and the Mariana Islands, but includes, you know, Kabul, Afghanistan, and so on, well, you're taking our responsibility. So these things, this vague aesthetic sense is, is, is deeply, deeply incoherent, I think, for both left and right. What I would point out is that the original distinction between left and right created by the French Revolution was instead a distinction between those who believed in reason, reason with a capital R, versus those who believed in the value of culture and tradition. So one of the defining moments for the French Revolution was the creation of the metric system. Creation of the metric system proceeded from purely abstract, rational thought. They said, okay, what's the difference between the North Pole and the equator? We're going to divide that into a consistent number of units, and we're going to create a new measure that has nothing to do with any particular historical king or the legend of Jesus in Israel. It doesn't connect to anything. This is going to be straight up abstract, rational reasoning. And they, they devised a whole new calendar. They created a calendar that had nothing to do with Christianity and had nothing to do with the Roman Empire. And in this way, the, the fundamental concept of the left in the French Revolution was that the, um, the dead weight of millennia of cultural accretions could be cast aside and that reason, reason with a capital R, could create a new and better ordered world for everybody, for the rich and the poor alike, that we could get rid of crass superstition and the accretion of, of these things. And this put the right, uh, the conservatives, not in the role of opposing progress, but in the role of being the people who could appreciate culture, who could appreciate tradition. And let's be clear, culture doesn't necessarily have to be backward looking. It can be forward looking. It, it can be creative, but it can be also based on learning from the experience of others. Of saying like today, hey, look at Denmark. Do you think Denmark maybe has a better healthcare system? Do you think Sweden maybe has better prisons? Do you think Taiwan has a better system of referenda, you know, of, of voting and direct democracy? Um, learning empirically from your own traditions, from your own history, that's one thing. Learning from the cultural traditions, history, and experience of others. Of being the more empirically based, uh, bottom-up mode of, of thinking, as opposed to this abstract procedure from the top down. Guys, we live in an era where political parties are bought and sold by businessmen. And that is the reason why mainstream politics has become philosophically bankrupt. And it's our job, yours and mine, to generate a new philosophy, a new ethos in politics, left, right, and center, right here on the internet, right here on YouTube. Dun, 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 dun.